She's trying to get you to look at me. <laughs> Good morning, Unity Church. Morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, I'm Pastor Karen, pastor here. Uh, now is the time where we share news and needs. Does anybody have anything they want to share? Tiffany has toilets. I don't know if she's going to tell you that, but praise God, she's got toilets. <laughs> yes, two out of three. Um, next week after church, directly after church, we're having a food and fellowship, like an elevated coffee hour. Um, coffee will be in the lounge and um, snacks, just finger foods in the transept. Um, we would love everyone to save the date and come for just a little while and uh, get a time to chat with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, if you would like to bring anything, that would be great. Um, just finger foods, nothing um, nothing too involved, unless you really want to, but um, finger foods. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Next week. It. Next week, stay. Stay after church. <laughs> um, I have one before I get to Chris. I am looking for some secret shoppers because... Anybody who is willing to be a secret shopper at one or more places, please talk with me because there's another pastor in the presbytery who's going to do her part of the presbytery and I'm going to get, try to get people to be secret shoppers in our presbytery or in our part of the presbytery. So if you are willing to go someplace for an hour for me, talk to me. I don't have any secret shopper things, but uh, I am selling something. Uh, we're, the barbecue tickets are on sale. Uh, bef after church, I'll be over in the transept, and then before church next week as well, and they're $10, and it is uh, September 23rd, so it's Saturday. Barbecue, barbecue. Anybody else have news and needs? It's a Steeler day. Can you tell? <laughs> Yeah, this is as close as I've got to black and gold, everybody. Get, you'll have to get over it. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> good morning. Um, I have two things, one good, one not so good. Um, uh, Rowan and Trevor, who most of you know, and mm -hmm. myself and our family, uh, we are growing. It is not me, but my stepdaughter is pregnant. She got married last year there in Ohio, so the boys are going to be uncles, and they are super excited, so if you see them, um, don't call me grandma, call them uncle. Um, so <laughs> prayers, if you would, for a healthy pregnancy, we're due in March. So, um, Also, prayers for a family in our school that Trevor, um, Trevor has one of the kids is in school with Trevor, and then there's two younger ones, sixth grade and third grade, that I'm pretty involved with through subbing. Um, they lost their father last night, so very young. Um, so if you could just keep that family in your prayers, our family would appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish to thank everybody that prayed for Debbie, but she couldn't have the operation done. Yeah, this is the third week that they have moved her back because she had other things wrong with her. She had a toe infection, and they could not do the surgery. So I don't know when the surgery will be done. We'll keep praying for her, though. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate keep that. praying for her. Anybody else have news or needs? All right, let's calm our hearts, uh, experience the music, and come into God's presence.
Teach us, O head, your ways of grace and mercy. Remind us, God, of our minds, that even if only two or three gather, guide us into the love of all people and things. Okay, the time has come. Where are all these kids in their backpacks? Come on up. We are going to put your backpacks, put your backpacks on, the, on the top here, and then you can come sit down on the lower steps, okay? Any workers out there with their briefcases? I, I have one up here. <laughs> okay, oh my gosh, look at this crowd of kids. My goodness, so happy to see you all. This is a great day because we are celebrating going back to school. We're celebrating starting Sunday school and we're here to do a blessing. Now school started this week and most of you are back in your daily routines, right? And most of you use, of course, a backpack. And s you use these backpacks to carry all your school supplies, your books, back and forth. Sometimes some of you have books in your backpack that are so heavy, that's all you can manage to carry. You couldn't carry one more thing in your backpack. Anybody ex experience that? 
really heavy backpacks? Oh yeah. So, so they are loaded with those heavy books and that's all that we can manage to carry. Now, life is a lot like that. Did you know that? Sometimes we have some heavy burdens, worries, just like those heavy books. These are heavy worries that are on our mind, right? Some of us may be worried that you won't have any friends in your class or that other kids won't like you. Or maybe some of you are worried that you might not be able to do the work in your new grade or that you might fail. Well, those can be pretty heavy problems or burdens or worries to carry around, right? Anybody worried about their new grade? Was anybody before they started school maybe a little worried? Of course, sure. So that is why today we are blessing you and your backpacks. But first, what is a blessing? Anyone have an answer? What is a blessing? I had a feeling it was going to be you, Marcus. Like a miracle. Like a miracle? Okay. It is sort of a miracle. Anybody else? Come on. Um, like a prayer said over something okay. so that God looks upon it and like gives it his grace. Yes. You guys were both right where it is a gift from God. And sometimes that gift can go from God can seem like a miracle, right? All good things that we have comes from God. God gives us blessings like the rain to keep things green and growing, the food we have to eat, people who care for us, a place of worship, clothes to wear, Friends, homes to keep us warm and dry, soft beds to sleep on, and the list goes on and on. Who can think of what God has blessed you with? What? Parents. Your parents. And guess what? Your parents are blessed to have you. God gave your parents the gift of you. And God gave you the gift of your parents. What else might be a blessing in your life? What has God given you? Friends. Friends, that's a great one. Love. Love. Oh my gosh, I think that's the most important. He gave us a family. He gave us a family. Anybody have a pet? Did, did God give you, bless you with a pet? Uh huh. Sometimes you hear people saying, I am so blessed. Sometimes they're blessed to have a great job. Sometimes they're blessed to just be around other people. Now, can you bless others or can only God bless you? Can you bless others? Yeah? How can you do that? Saying a prayer. Saying a prayer for someone. That's right. Um, doing something nice for somebody, right? You can pray to God for somebody, and that's asking him to bless that person. Like, when you, like, go through the stones when people die, maybe they can talk to you, and they need to say a question to you. That's right. That's very nice. Be kind to others when they got hurt. That's exactly right. Those are all blessings. One more. Even your fur you have a boo-boo. That's right. You can make them feel better. Maybe, you have, maybe there's somebody at school that doesn't have a friend. And you can bless them by going and talking to them and maybe being their friend, right? Very good. Okay, so we thought of what other blessings there are. We found out that we can bless others. So 
we are asking God to bless you and your backpacks so you can have a great school year and so he can guide you and help you to do well in school and take away those heavy burdens. All your worries he'll take away. So let's do that now with Miss Hannah. She is going to give you, she is going to Hold your hands and bow, bow your head. All right. Lord, bless these backpacks and give the children and youth who carry them as they begin yet another year of school. Give them peace when they feel nervous, focus when they feel distracted, energy when they feel tired. Open their minds to the lessons they will learn both inside and outside the classroom. Help them make friends that build up one another and be friends to those who need them. Guide them in making good choices as they grow in wisdom and maturity. Be ever present with them in the classroom, on the school bus, on the playground, during sports, and at home. And may they feel your loving care in all they do. Amen. So if I could ask anybody who has um, volunteered to help to be a roamer this year, anybody who's ever helped teach uh, Sunday school, anyone who works in the nursery or ever helped in the nursery, I would like you to stand and we are now going to bless our teachers and our helpers. I know there's some of you out there. Thank you for volunteering. Volunteering. Yes. Yes. Anybody who always gives me a hand. Okay. So let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we pray for our Sunday school teachers, volunteers, and nursery caretakers. Help them to diligently seek you through your word to gain knowledge and insight in order to teach to those who are in their classrooms. May their love for you be evident as they teach and keep all safe. Give them the opportunity to lead our young hearts to a saving knowledge of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we just prayed for our students and teachers. Well, the congregation is going to be doing some praying for you too. They're going to be praying for your schools. Your parents all gave me the names of the schools you go to, not the school districts, the actual schools. And what's that? What's that? Oh, okay. Oh, they're right here. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not in charge of these, but here they are. Okay, so anyways, Pastor Karen wrote out all of these slips of paper with a different name of a school on each slip for each of you to come and take one and pray for that school for the week or forever. Forever and ever. So you can let you can let your teacher know that your school's being your school's being prayed for. Okay, so um, after that, Miss Nadine has something to give to you for each of you to have with you when you go to school. Good morning, everybody. We're almost done with this, but part of the blessing that we're offering you today for the blessing of the backpacks is to talk to you about angels. Does everybody know what an angel is? I think we all know what angels What do you think an angel looks like? I know the color of it, but it's white. White, okay. Um, it blessed other people when they die and when like like you said about someone they they go do the walks and they pray for them very good anybody else the triplets they pray for god they pray for god okay i think probably most of us would guess that angels look a lot like us we can't see them 
Sometimes, though, they might, we might have angels in our lives that we can see. A friend, our parents, grandparents. Sometimes people just come across and they're so kind to us, they're like having an angel. The most important thing to remember about angels is that God made them. And they are messengers from God. So part of what we want to give you today as a blessing is a little guardian angel token that you can carry with you on your backpack. And this guardian angel is meant to help you remember, like Miss Nancy mentioned about when you have burdens and worries. If you think about the little angel that you're carrying with you, that might bring you a lot of comfort. Angels are messengers. So there was an angel that t told Mary about her baby be Jesus being born. They can also protect us. Remember the story about Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in the fiery furnace? There was an angel sent by God to protect them. So I think that we all have angels that are always with us. And when we're worried or troubled or frightened, think about the angel who's with you alongside with God, okay? So I'm going to give each of you this special angel token to attach to your backpacks. The token is right inside there. If you want to unsnap it, you'll be able to see it. It's almost like a coin. Can somebody read what's on the back of it? What does it say on the back of it? Who would like to read that? Always with you. Always with you. Okay. Well, I think it's time. It's time to go upstairs. We'll leave our backpacks here. Your parents can get them after worship and then come up and get you. Let's go. We seek the will of God, but still find ourselves conformed to this world instead of being transformed into God's image. Let's, let, let us seek forgiveness for the ways we have turned away from God's call. Great teacher, we come to you in this quiet space to share everything that weighs us down and makes us weary. We acknowledge that we are not always the best students and sometimes we don't pay attention to the lessons you try to teach us. God's grace is abundant. God's love is never ending. As children of God, receive forgiveness and blessing. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all.
So while the choir gets back in place, whoever it was who talked to me about moving the flowers up, remember whoever that was? I don't remember who that was, but I'm moving them back to the back while the choir is singing. Did you see why? Poor, poor Bob and Forrest were back there behind those big flowers, right? <laughs> so now I know why they were always in the back because somebody said it when the choir had stopped. And so, oh, that's why they're in the back. So when the choir isn't singing, we can have them up here. And then when the choir is singing, we can have them back there. So that's a funny little housekeeping thing in our house, right? <laughs> Let's pray. Our God, we ask that you would help us know how to love children rather than hate children. Help us to know what it means to welcome kids and hug them and bless them in the very way you did because you are in our midst as them. We give you thanks for the kids in our church and that our church has kids. We pray that we would better serve them in the coming years. Amen. I'm going to tell three stories today, so that's a departure from my norm. Uh, one is just about, it's set in the out and about world, so just out there. And two are from church life. They're in vignettes that I think point to the ways in which we hate children in the 21st century sometimes. And uh, so we, we hate them sometimes. And I think they're going to show a spectrum between hate and apathy, mm, putting children just lower on the scale of value than other things. Okay, so they're somewhere in that range. Uh, and our first scripture reading today is Mark 9, verses 33 through 37 and 42 through 43. Jesus and his disciples entered Capernaum. When they had come into a house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on your journey? They didn't respond since on the way they had been debating with each other about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve to him, and said, Whoever wants to be first must be least of all and servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child and placed him among the twelve and embraced him. And then he said, Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. As for whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to trip and fall into sin, it would be better for them to have a huge stone hung around their necks and to be thrown into the lake. If your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than to go away with two hands into the fire of hell which cannot be put out. Some people hate children and are in danger of needing a huge stone around their neck. So what does that look like today? My grandson met me in California when I visited my mom a few weeks ago. It was the first time any of the three of them had been on a plane since the beginning of the pandemic. He, because he's less than three, and they, because they didn't travel during the pandemic. So he's in the airport, and he's wearing a mask, and he's with my son-in-law. And a man comes up to my two-year-old grandson and goes, <coughs> right? And he says to my two-year-old grandson, you won't get sick from me because you're wearing a mask, right? Now, since he's not yet three, that's just hatred right there. He's not teaching the kids something. He's too little to understand what's going on. He's not engaging with the parent. Why are you, you know, he's not having a dialogue. It's just hate. Now, not just given your reactions, I was already assuming that every single person in this room would agree with my assessment of that story, regardless of what you think about masks, right? <laughs> Y'all agree with my assessment of that story. 
That guy does not know whether my grandson has leukemia or HIV or some other dread disease. It's hard to imagine that he would do that to an adult. And my son-in-law, who one day you will meet because now they're willing to fly, is six feet eight inches tall. When he was on the O-line, look, people in the church know what that is, in this church. <laughs> when he was on the O-line, he was as big as the fridge. He was ginormous, over, three, over 300 pounds. He is not a person who is unintimidating. Right? So the guy isn't going to that, do that to an adult because he might get slugged but he's willing to do it to my two-year-old grandson because he wants to give a comment to the 30-something-year-old dad, and he probably knows that 30-something-year-old dad that if that grandson was not there, would have slugged him. <laughs> uh, he knows he won't haul off and slug him with the kid there, which was true. Therefore, that child has become an object a tool, right? He is no longer a human being in the eyes of the person that's coughing on him, especially not one made in the image of God who deserves basic respect. The huge stone is looming in his life. So the person who will use and abuse a child to make his political and social statement to a total stranger doesn't care. He doesn't love his neighbor. He hates his neighbor in that moment. For all I know, that guy was a churchgoer. Don't kid yourself. These things happen. <laughs> I don't know. That man, however, now that you've had your first moment of outrage, that man deserves our pity. Because he doesn't know that he should jump in the river with a rock around his neck or chop off his opinion or his arrogance or whatever is causing him to sin in that way. To objectify that child rather than understanding that this is someone who's made in the image of God and deserves respect. So Jesus is saying, cut off that opinion if it causes you to sin. You cannot enter the presence of God caring more about that than about that human being. So I think that there is an entire sort of justice mission field for Christians, if we want to take it on, to intervene in the way that folks mistreat children, hate children in this country. We objectify children, we don't provide for children, for both the kids' sake and for the sake of those who are behaving badly. There's an entire ministry there. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I don't want anybody kidding themselves that there aren't people in the world that hate children. Okay? So, our second reading is Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing children to Jesus so that he would bless them. But the disciples scolded them. When Jesus saw this, he grew angry and said to them, Allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them. Because God's realm belongs to people like these children. I assure you that whoever doesn't welcome God's realm like a child will never enter it. And then he hugged the children and blessed them. That's a great moment in scripture. He hugged the children and blessed them. So there are some generic rules of thumb for welcoming kids into relationship with Jesus that the church should just follow. For example, when we provide children with age-inappropriate materials, which happens, and we see that that's not good for that child, if we fix the problem, we love the child, and if we don't fix the problem, we are not loving the child. Right? It could be an honest mistake. Perfectly honest mistake, but once we've seen that those kids can't handle or are too old for that thing we're presenting. If we don't adjust, 
we are caring more about our materials or our prep than our kids. So we slide over into not welcoming kids. Conversely, when we provide age-appropriate materials, even if it's not an adult favorite, so this is a thing, right, in worship, when we share worship, we love our kids. So that last statement has all, everything to do with how we are going to change worship next summer, just for the summer. Unless we go to pull out church in the summer, we need to do some different things at Unity with our summer worship, because you've seen our kids don't come to church in summer a lot of the time. And frankly, I don't blame them. So we need to be, for a few months of the year, 10 weeks of the year, doing some things that are more appropriate. I got lots of ideas for that. So. <laughs> but I have encountered this problem everywhere I've gone, where people can't really see the kid in the church, right? So. When I, Forrest, went off to Washington to be the pastor, I was not the pastor. I was the pastor's wife. I was happy to not be the pastor. <laughs> but I volunteered with the youth program because I like teenagers. Teenagers like me, and that is an underserved group usually in the church, right? <laughs> it's easy to get people to work with the five-year-olds, not so much the 15-year-olds. <clears throat> so I get there. But the pre-existing situation is that the youth director and the elder that's in charge of overseeing this program are at loggerheads. Like, they are fighting, 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 fighting. And so here's one, and here's the other, and here's poor me in the middle, right? <laughs> you need to talk to him. You need to teach him theologically. You need to talk to her. She doesn't understand about kids. Like, right, and here I am in the middle, pastor's wife. Um, it was a very interesting thing. The elder wanted... The, she was in her 70s, and she wanted the youth director to only use, like, the top 25 hymns of the history of the church. Like, nothing that had been made, done in the last 40 years, probably, and because it hadn't become one of the top 25 because it was new. And so this was a big thing between them. Oh, music. Man, it was a big thing. Uh, so very interestingly, I try to get out of that conflict. So I spent time thinking about what could happen. So one day I say to the elder, hey, you know, I came up with a solution. Uh, you want them to learn, you know, how great they are and amazing grace and great is thy faithfulness. And um, when we went to Skagway, Alaska for Presbytery, the Saturday night uh, entertainment was partly was a band from the church. People in the church were in the band. And so they used the first stanza of famous hymns to, as the entertainment. It was very interesting. So, like, they played Amazing Grace to five different songs. And one of them was uh, House of the Rising Sun, and one was Gilligan's Island, because whatever, you people who are musical understand that words can go to different, like we did that song today that was Morning is Broken, which is not Morning is Broken, it's half a dozen hymns with different words, and it has the same tune, right? So that was the idea. I said, so we could do a song a month. Like, we're not going to get somebody in to play for these kids every single week. That was not going to happen. So I was like, but we could get somebody in the church to come play a song a month, and we could have a song of the month, and they could practice that, the words of that hymn to all these different songs that the kids will know. Because her big thing was that modern music has terrible words, and these old hymns survive because they have great words, right? That was her thing. It was her thing, her thing, her thing, over and over. The words, the words, the words, the words. Well, my little suggestion revealed that it was not just the words, right? She wanted the whole kit and caboodle for these kids. So uh, that was helpful. She had a complete inability to either, I'm not even sure to this day, whether it was an inability to sort out what she really wanted, or she knew what she really wanted, and she was unable to be honest about it because she knew that that was not going to fly. I don't know which it was. But I'm going to tell you something. She caused drama and trouble and anxiety since long before I got there. Lots of conversation was about her rather than the kids. 
It was incredible how much she was stealing time and energy and care from the children that had been brought to our church. And we were a very successful youth group with a ton of kids who didn't go to church and didn't have parents around. But she was unable, as both an adult and as an elder, to deal with herself. I should not have been spending time on that conflict. But, I mean, I turned over that rock and showed her, right? We had some high-risk kids. It was a high-risk community. We had some high-risk kids. We had some medium-risk kids. And then we had a couple low-risk kids like my kid. And these, these kids needed intervention. They needed time. And she did not deserve or need my time. She became worth my time because she was so much trouble. But she was a person of privilege and power and influence, and she abused that. She abused her gifts and her realities by taking up all this energy in the youth program towards something she didn't even, wasn't even honest or didn't know what she really wanted. She got stuck in the weeds. So that's one kind of abuser. Somebody who's just either unaware or unhonest about what their thing is, and you can't move forward in the conversation. And it takes up a lot of time and a lot of energy, and it just sucks the life out of the room. That's one kind of abuser. But the church is subject to abusers of all kinds because we choose niceness over truth and avoidance over honesty when people are behaving badly. So in Alaska once, we had to send around this risk man management VHS. I hope everybody in this room knows what a VHS tape is. <laughs> so we didn't want to watch it during the session meeting. So we made a little sign-up sheet and like we said, okay, somebody take it, watch it, hand it to the next person. Everybody just sign it so we can report with honesty to the insurance company that we have all watched it. And we, you know, we weren't policing them if they were going to lie and sign. We weren't going to lie. Everybody had to have signed the sheet. So we reported to the insurance company that we had all watched this risk management uh, seminar. Uh, but they didn't want to put doors in, or windows in the doors, or leave the doors open for Sunday school, which was one of the things in this business that our insurance wanted. And they did not want to do what our insurance wanted. It was funny because one of the things in Alaska, there's no privacy in Alaska ever. So there are half a dozen registered sex offenders in our church. And everybody knew that. Like, this was not a secret. And also, Alaska is incredibly violent. And there is tons of violence in homes. And so we knew that there was plenty of violence in our homes. These were not hidden problems in our community. And nor were they hidden in our church, not the larger community or in the church. I, I couldn't figure out why we couldn't have like a rational conversation about this. So that response lands, just not even being able to have the conversation, lands somewhere between apathy, I don't think that's hatred of children, I think it's somewhere between ap apathy and putting the children on a lower scale in the value system than something else. But I'll tell you what else happened. <laughs> that was, we were in Alaska during the Catholic priest scandal hitting the like national never ending news, right? And there was tons of public criticism about the people who pretended it didn't happen or moved these pro problematic priests around. Because it's like 4% of priests. Like it's 96% of priests are great guys, right? Well, maybe not great guys, but they're not abusing children, right? <laughs> Some of them are great guys, right? But they're not abusing children. It's a tiny little percentage, but they do a lot of damage. And they were moved around. And so there was tons of criticism about people who look the other way. And so suddenly our session was willing to do more. We had somebody in the church who was happy to put in windows or whatever in one day. Like, it wasn't hard. Just leave the door open. Like, we weren't even suggesting structural changes. Now, whether that was to avoid evil that they thought might come or avoid the appearance of evil for the comfort of the people who take their children to church, it didn't really matter. It didn't really matter. It was for the kids. Sometimes we care more for our illusions than for the children. 
children are less important to us than the things we want to pretend about. We want to pretend it's not happening or it might not happen. No one here would ever do that. So I do think the first scripture is telling us that we are failing the people who might cause trouble with kids as much as we are failing the kids, actually. But the second scripture reminds us that the disciples misunderstood something fundamental about Jesus and being Jesus-y when they scolded the parents. Let's be honest, I could have told you all kinds of motivating and interesting positive stories, uh, what they used to call in my college about when they served water at parties, uh, equally attractive alternatives. (laughs) (laughs) Of people loving children, loving small children, loving an individual child. But the truth is the shall nots are as important as the shalls. But I don't want to be a complainer. I just want us to recognize that there's negative behavior in the world and we got to watch out for it. I believe in encouraging people toward the light and the good and the right because that is where God lives. God is found in love because God is love. So let's remind ourselves that when, why do parents bring children to church? Why do parents bring children to Jesus for blessing, for healing, for help? There should never be a stumbling moment in the congregational setting for those kids. Because children are special in scripture. They are in a special category. And yet, Unity Church. I have already heard the 30 years apart stories, so you do not need to come up to me and afterwards and tell me there's more. (laughs) I have already heard the 30 years apart stories of how in this very sanctuary, and probably at Dormont, don't kid yourself, Dormont people, but in this very sanctuary, (laughs) this has happened once since I came, okay? Okay. Parents have been slipped an anonymous note, or grandparents, parents or grandparents, slipped an anonymous note from somebody in the church telling them to get their children in line, to behave better. So I am sorry if that happened to you. I am so sorry if you were a recipient of that kind of note. If you were one of the writers of that note, I do not want to know. But you made Jesus mad. It would have been better for you to stick a rock around your neck and jump into one of the oceans or one of the rivers. We have three of them. You could choose. (laughs) Than for you to scold one of those parents who are trying to bring their Jesus, their child to Jesus. May it not happen while I am here. Because Jesus loves the little children and greets them with hugs and blessings. We are living in a nation with a rapidly, precipitously falling birth rate. I think that is partly because we do not care for children in this country. We got to find a way at Unity Church to bring kids in with welcome and encourage parents rather than scold them. So may it be so among us. Amen.
teaching kids is a challenge. I am inviting you to the offering, but first I want to tell you how we taught our kids about the offering. I have told you this story once before, but I thought I should tell you differently. So we had this thing with our kid, starting when she was three. She got a dollar, which honestly she had no idea what money was, right? She got a dollar uh, allowance every week, right? You start them early, teach them. So she got, she had four little jars, and they all had a sign. So the first one said tithe. So she had her tithe jar, and every week she put a dime in it. And then she had her long-term savings jar, which was a little bit bigger. <laughs> and she put a quarter in it. And then she had her spending jar, and she put a quarter in it. And then she put her last 40 cents in her short-term savings jar that was the biggest jar. We wanted her to learn something about the value of money, but also we wanted her to learn something about what it means when God says, the first fruits will come to me, and they will be a tenth of your giving, right? And so she would go off to, Sun so we took the kids' offering in Sunday school before, we didn't have pull-out church, we had Sunday school before church. She'd go off to the little three-year-old self, off to the Sunday school <laughs> offering, and she'd put her dime in the plate. And he, I thought it was adorable, but also spoke truth. And the adults in the church were always trying to give her a dollar to put in the plate. Totally unrelated to her life and her money and her... We were trying to teach them something, and they weren't coughing on her like a three. They were trying to do something good, and they were undermining our teaching. <laughs> and I didn't want her to learn to put a dollar in the plate because she'd still be putting a dollar in at 90, right? <laughs> we wanted to her to learn about graduated giving, and that as you have more, more is expected of you, and that is clear in Scripture. But man, if you got a dime, God is happy with your dime. And the thing I love about my kid... And she would just look at them with her big eyes. She had those big eyes like a Gerber baby. She'd look at them and she'd say, God's happy with my dime. And she'd, <laughs> and she'd say no to the dollar. And, you know, person after person told me this story because they kept trying to give her a buck. God is happy with your dime. If that is what God has called you to and what God has given you, God is happy. But where your money is, your heart is. So let's show where our heart is by giving in our offering today.
Great God. With you, every transition and every new start is a reminder of your goodness. For you are always creating fresh, amazing things in us and through us. Though we are, some of us, quite sad about the summer ending, we are grateful for the turn of the year towards school. And we appreciate the opportunity that it brings to all of us to learn and to grow, knowing it is one of the big biggest privileges we have. And so with thanks and love, we offer everything we are to you, asking for your blessing. We pray as and for students of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. We pray for our hearts and all they hold, excitement and nervousness, disappointment and hope. We give you all our love and fears. We pray for steady self-esteem and deepening resilience among our kids and our adults. We pray for our minds that they will expand with wonder and in celebration, learning not just from books studied, but from the people beside us. Open our minds with a willingness to change in unexpected ways and settle our thought loops in peaceful places. We pray for our hands that they will reach out to with welcome and care to others. Bless our hands with patience and dedication as they grip pencils and type on keyboard and swish paintbrushes and clap in song as they grip monkey bars and lunchbox handles and spin wheelchair tires and basketballs. We pray for our mouths that they will speak words bringing life and connection. Help us use our mouths to honor the dignity and belovedness of all. Remind us to open our mouths for deep belly breaths when we're, feeling, when we're feeling anxious or afraid. We pray for our feet, that they will move toward those different from us and help others in safe ways. Plant our feet next to those who feel alone and bless our steps down hallways and sidewalks. We know that you are with us wherever our feet go or stay. We pray for our eyes that we may see ourselves and others with compassion. Point our eyes towards those who are forget forgotten or struggling. Grow us in flexibility to see from all kinds of angles and opinions. Bless what and how we see, whether we're looking at a screen or a whiteboard or the beauty of a person's face. And help us to see with the most important eyes, the eyes of the spirit that dwells within us. We pray for our ears that they will genuinely listen to all voices, especially those who haven't been listened to much. When things get noisy, help us to listen extra carefully for your voice. Help us to hear with the most important ears, the ears of the Spirit within us. And we say a special prayer for parents. As the start of a new year is always another leap of faith, Wrap them with your reassuring love as they entrust their children to various people, strangers, and friends, and trust in you. When questions remain unanswered and the realm of control is finite, bless them with peace and pro the promise that you are right there with their child, whether heavy, heading to preschool or driving to college. And now we pray for teachers, staff, and administrators. Bless those faithful servants with courage and confidence, knowing you are in their classroom with a steady hand on their shoulder. Give them peace, patience, and balance in the pressures they face, bravery to build structures and systems which justly serve all your children. Give them delight in the young ones before them and recognition of the ways children are also teachers. And we pray especially for the schooling situations in our church. We pray for the kids of the Unity Food Pantry who have already received their backpacks and the kids of the Unity Preschool who are bringing their backpacks to be blessed. We pray for the schools that our kids go to, to Carleton, Carleton, Carl, Carleton whatever, elementary school, Carleton High School, Charters Valley Primary School, Charters Valley Intermediate School, Charters Valley High School, Charter, or what, yeah, yeah, something. 
God, you know, middle school and high school. Aiken Elementary School, Pleasant Valley Elementary School, Noah's Ark Preschool, Hoover Elementary School, Aquinas Academy, Keystone Oaks High School, and the Goddard School. And we pray that we would take a name and we would pray for that school this year and that they would be covered in a protective cloud. We pray for health and wholeness, fun and growth, surprise and amazement for the school year ahead, knowing that you will hold us all the way through, come what may. So loving God, hold us in our prayers, including our prayers for our joys and concerns in this room today. We pray for the sufferers of the earthquake in Marrakesh and the typhoons in Asia. We pray for the Maui recovery to keep going. We pray for the political season that is heating up, for sanity and service in that. We pray for Debbie Phillips' infection and for things to stop getting in the way of her surgery. We pray for that family that's known by the Olsteins and the Buttermores whose dad died last night. We pray for the Olsteins' oldest who's going to have that child. We pray for the Olsteins to live into being grandparents and uncles. And we pray for Iris, who we've been praying for, for her high blood pressure and her surgery for melanoma on Friday. We pray that the teachers will know how to stand with her. And we pray for Kathy Cummins, who is undergoing heart surgery on Thursday. We ask that you would be with those we love and you would be with us as we love those that we know you love. We thank you, God, and we love you. And we ask you to guide us together in unity as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. understand and think I'm just pointing the finger at everybody else. I once had that VHS moment here at Unity. I, uh, I had a moment where somebody was bringing up stuff that needed to, we needed to address. And I, I was not having it that night. <laughs> and I was, you know, meh. <laughs> and I apologize to that person. Uh, you know, I'd had a week of complaints and I didn't need another one or another thing to fix. But they were right, and actually, so I said, it'll come up again because we're working on an emergency plan. But in the reality, in the moment, I quenched the spirit. Absolutely, I quenched the spirit. The person was bringing up good concerns, and I was the problem that day. God and our children, or that person and our children, deserved our time and God's attention. And I was the problem in the room. So, it can happen to any of us. Let's try to love our kids. 
Now may our God bless each in this room. May we go forth in power and in strength and authority because we have been blessed. May we carry the spirit with us out into the world. May we re recognize the spirit in other people and may we work together for the good, especially the good of our kids. And help us, God, to pound down the door with our prayers for our kids. Amen.